In today's video, we are talking about how much radiation is on Mars. Watch the whole video and find out this secret. Let's start the video. Natural radiation on Mars is much higher compared with Earth. The thin atmosphere provides only a small shielding effect against cosmic radiation. It provides moderate protection against solar radiation. Mars also lacks the magnetosphere that protects Earth. The average natural radiation level on Mars is 24 to 30 rads or 240 to 300 evs per year. This is about 40 to 50 times the average on Earth. How bad is the radiation on Mars? Human exploration of Mars has been ramping up in the past few decades. In addition to the eight active missions on or around the Red Planet, seven more robotic landers, rovers and orbiters are scheduled to be deployed there by the end of the decade. And by the 2030s and after, several space agencies are planning to mount crewed missions to the surface as well. On top of that, there are even plenty of volunteers who are prepared to make a one-way journey to Mars and people advocating that we turn it into a second home. All of these proposals have focused attention on the peculiar hazards that come with sending human beings to Mars. Aside from its cold, dry environment, lack of air, and huge sandstorms, there's also the matter of its radiation. Causes Mars has no protective magnetosphere, as Earth does. Scientists believe that at one time, Mars also experienced convection currents in its core, creating a dynamo effect that powered a planetary magnetic field. However, roughly 4.2 billion years ago, either due to a massive impact from a large object or rapid cooling in its core, this dynamo effect ceased. As a result, over the course of the next 500 million years, Mars' atmosphere was slowly stripped away by solar wind. Between the loss of its magnetic field and its atmosphere, the surface of Mars is exposed to much higher levels of radiation than Earth. And in addition to regular exposure to cosmic rays and solar wind, it receives occasional lethal blasts that occur with strong solar flares. If we successfully land on Mars, could we live there? NASA's 2000 and one Mars Odyssey spacecraft was equipped with a special instrument called the Martian Radiation Experiment, or MARI, which was designed to measure the radiation environment around Mars. Since Mars has such a thin atmosphere, radiation detected by Mars Odyssey would be roughly the same as on the surface. Over the course of about 18 months, the Mars Odyssey probe detected ongoing radiation levels, which are 2.5 times higher than what astronauts experience on the International Space Station. 22 millirads per day, which works out to 8,000 millirads, 8 rads, per year. The spacecraft also detected two solar proton events, where radiation levels peak at about 2,000 millirads in a day, and a few other events that got up to about 100 millirads. For comparison, human beings in developed nations are exposed to, on average, 0.62 rads per year. And while studies have shown that the human body can withstand a dose of up to 200 rads without permanent damage, prolonged exposure to the kinds of levels detected on Mars could lead to all kinds of health problems like acute radiation sickness, increased risk of cancer, genetic damage, and even death. And given that exposure to any amount of radiation carries with it some degree of risk, NASA and other space agencies maintain a strict policy of ALRI, as low as reasonable achievable when planning missions. Possible Solutions Human explorers to Mars will definitely need to deal with the increased radiation levels on the surface. What's more, any attempts to colonize the Red Planet will also require measures to ensure that exposure to radiation is minimized. Already, several solutions both short-term and long have been proposed to address this problem. For example, NASA maintains multiple satellites that study the Sun, the space environment throughout the solar system, and monitor for galactic cosmic rays GCRs, in the hopes of gaining a better understanding of solar and cosmic radiation. They've also been looking for ways to develop better shielding for astronauts and electronics. In 2014, NASA launched the Reducing Galactic Cosmic Rays Challenge, an incentive-based competition that awarded a total of $12,000 
to ideas on how to reduce astronauts' exposure to galactic cosmic rays. After the initial challenge in April of 2014, a follow-up challenge took place in July that awarded a prize of $30,000 for ideas involving active and passive protection. When it comes to long-term stays in colonization, several more ideas have been floated in the past. For instance, as Robert Sabrin and David Baker explained in their proposal for a low-cast Mars direct mission, habitats built directly into the ground would be naturally shielded against radiation. Zubrin expanded on this in his 1996 book, The Case for Mars, The Plan to Settle the Red Planet and Why We Must. Proposals have also been made to build habitats above ground using inflatable modules encased in ceramics created using Martian soil, similar to what has been proposed by both NASA and the ESA for a settlement on the moon. This plan would rely heavily on robots using 3D printing technique, known as sintering, where sand is turned into a molten material using X-rays. Marsone, the nonprofit organization dedicated to colonizing Mars in the coming decades, also has proposals for how to shield Martian settlers. Addressing the issue of radiation, the organization has proposed building shielding into the mission's spacecraft, transit vehicle, and habitation module. In the event of a solar flare, where this protection is insufficient, they advocate creating a dedicated radiation shelter located in a hollow water tank inside their Mars transit habitat. But perhaps the most radical proposal for reducing Mars exposure to harmful radiation involves jump-starting the planet's core to restore its magnetosphere. To do this, we would need to liquefy the planet's outer core so that it can convect around the inner core once again. The planet's own rotation would begin to create a dynamo effect, and a magnetic field would be generated. According to Sam Factor, a graduate student with the Department of Astronomy at the University of Texas, there are two ways to do this. The first would be to detonate a series of thermonuclear warheads near the planet's core, while the second involves running an electric current through the planet, producing resistance at the core which would heat it up. Extreme Heat Mars is the last planet of the inner four terrestrial planets in the solar system, at an average distance of 141 million miles from our Sun. It revolves around the Sun every 687 days and rotates every 24.6 hours, nearly the same as Earth. Mars has two tiny satellites, named Deimos and Phobos, shown below. They are most likely small asteroids drawn into Mars' gravitational pull. Demos and Phobos have diameters of just 7 miles and 14 miles, respectively. An interesting side note, the inner moon Phobos makes a revolution around Mars in slightly more than 7 hours. This means, since it orbits Mars faster than the planet rotates, the satellite rises in the west and sets in the east if observed from the Martian surface. The Martian atmosphere is composed primarily of carbon dioxide. However, unlike Venus, the Mars atmosphere is very thin, subjecting the planet to a bombardment of cosmic rays and producing very little greenhouse effect. Mariner 4, which flew by Mars on July 14, 1965, found that Mars has an atmospheric pressure of only 1 to 2 percent of the Earth's. Temperatures on Mars average about minus 81 degrees F. However, temperatures range from around minus 220 degrees F in the wintertime the poles to plus 70 degrees F over the lower latitudes in the summer. If you love similar content like this, take a look at my other videos. And if you like it, please smash the like button. If you have further questions, feel free to comment down below. See you in the next video.